it. I didn't forget it. Okay, can everybody see my PowerPoint now? Okay, good. All right, let's roll through this. Okay. What we're going to do um, at the beginning of this lecture is talk about patterns of health and disease, kind of pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus. And then what we're going to focus on, and this is what I know some of you in here have had my health psychology course, and there will be some overlap between health psychology and this particular course because there's some things that I think are important for you all to know personally and to know for your careers that just overlap between the two courses. Um, but what, but this course really is meant to focus not on everybody's health, but on women's health in particular. So then we'll focus in lecture on why, why study women's health um, as well as just generic human health. Okay. So prior to the pandemic last March, um, this is data from the Center for Disease Control, and it's listing the leading cause of death for people in the United States. And the reason why I want us to kind of conceptualize and think about causes of death is because there is so much behavior or other psychological influences like stress that influence us developing disease and particularly disease that kills people in the United States. Okay. But all of this is pre-virus. Okay. So I want us to contextualize this. So leading cause of death in the United States is coronary heart disease, which is usually um, death by heart attack. Okay. And one of the things that I want you all to know is that it's the leading cause of death or was the leading cause of death for men and for women. Okay. But if we were to go out on the street and interview lay individuals and ask them, what did they think is the leading cause of death for women? a lot of people would falsely think it's breast cancer, okay? And that's because we're scared of breast cancer, okay? Men can get breast cancer too, um, but it's normally a disease that women get and we're scared of it for a variety of reasons that I think are legitimate, um, but it's heart disease, okay? It's coronary heart disease for both men and women. After that, it is cancer deaths, and about half of men and a third of women are gonna have cancer at some point during their lifetime. And that's the second leading cause of death. And if we take coronary heart disease and cancer and we look at what are the factors that predict people getting those diseases and dying of those diseases, 65% of the variance in that prediction is attributed to three health behaviors. And those three health behaviors um, would be smoking or tobacco use. And then nowadays we got the vaping happening. So it could be traditional smoking, it could be vaping or other tobacco products is the one behavior that causes the most harm in our culture. Second to that would be high fat diet. And I'm really simplifying the nutrition piece. Nutrition is very complicated, but in general, people in the United States are consuming too much fat too little complex carbohydrate, too many animal products, too little plant-based products, okay? The third behavior over here is lack of exercise. The other term that we use for that, you exercise science folks know this, sedentary lifestyle, being too sedentary, being a couch potato, okay? So when we think about leading cause of death and second leading cause of death, we've got three very important health behaviors driving those deaths in the United States. Any questions about that? Okay. After that, number three, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And that is when individuals have lung damage and oftentimes end up relying on supplemental oxygen just to stay alive. And that is a rough disease to have. It really um, disables individuals and creates for a rather miserable existence when individuals have COPD. Number four on the list, um, sometimes we call this accidents, CDC calls them unintentional injuries. Um, and so this would be motor vehicle accidents, um, a person falls and hits their head, um, those kinds of things. Number five on the list is cerebrovascular disease or stroke. 
And the disease process that causes the heart attack for coronary heart disease that can lead to death, it's the same disease process, but it's occurring in the brain instead of in the heart. Okay, so number five would be stroke. Number six in the United States would be Alzheimer's which would be the disease that drives what we would call dementia. So Alzheimer's dementia um, is number six on the list. Number seven is diabetes. Diabetes will be moving up because it is becoming more prevalent. I want to pay us to pay attention to this one because number eight is when people got influenza or the flu. If the flu developed into pneumonia, usually the cause of death from the flu is the complication of getting pneumonia where the lungs um, become infected and fill with fluid. It's usually the pneumonia that takes that person's life. Um, so some individuals get the flu without it developing pneumonia. Sometimes individuals get uh, the flu, but usually if they die, it's because of pneumonia. Um, after that, number nine is nephritis kidney disease. And then after that would be number 10 would be suicide. Now keep in mind when we're talking about the, these statistics here, we're talking about all people in the United States. And the best predictor of disease, again, pre-pandemic, would be age. That makes sense. So part of the reason why number six Alzheimer's shows up here is that if we're looking at all Americans and if age is the best predictor of disease that causes death, then doesn't that make some sense? So we're looking at all people here. Does anybody have any questions? At this point. Okay, so all of this is pre pandemic. Um, and I want to show you, let me stop share. I want us to now talk about what has happened. All of this went down last March. You all know this because our spring break, remember, it turned from one week into two weeks, and then we weren't, then we didn't come back to school. Um, so all of the big outbreak last year happened here. But I just want to show you how rapidly this occurred. Let me make sure. Let me go over. I'm going to exit this. I have to talk to myself when I move around <laughs> in Zoom and PowerPoint to keep myself straight. So let me get my website up here. Okay. And then let me share the screen. I just want to show you how rapidly all of this happened. Um, Okay, can you see the website now, not the PowerPoint? Let me have some head nods. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm in the right place. Um, every now and then on Zoom, what we're seeing is not what you're seeing. That's why I'm gonna keep asking that question. Now, what I want you to focus on here is this starts, this is last March, March 1st, and it ends April 27th. And what I want you to pay attention to, just like the stats that we just went over here, um, leading causes of death for individuals in the US, um, I want you to watch what happens down here. There were four cases of COVID at the very bottom and watch what happens over time within a two month period. Did y'all realize how rapidly pandemic took over causes of death there? So all of that happened March and April of, of last year. Um, let me go back. And let me go back to PowerPoint. Okay, so as, a, as of April 27th of last year, Complications from infection from COVID-19 became the leading cause of death in the United States for men and for women, okay? And what we don't know necessarily, it's gonna take a while for the Center for Disease Control and the epidemiologists that, that work for them as well as World Health Organization is for us to get a better understanding of all of the individuals who are at risk when they develop that infection. 
Um, so as an example, we know um, having diabetes, type two diabetes, if, if you get infected and you have type two diabetes, there's a lot more likelihood that you're gonna have severe outcomes and li lot higher likelihood of, of having death from that infection than if you did not have type two diabetes as an example. It's gonna take a while before we truly understand um, the reshaping of what has killed individuals in the US and worldwide after this. Um, I just want you to know, I'm not gonna show you this information, but um, remember we were 2,470 back in April, and this was the last updated data that I put in here as of January 8th. Know that you can look this information up in the World Health Organization. You can look it up for the United States um, through the Center for Disease Control. Um, but we have had a dramatic shift in what um, takes lives worldwide since last year. Um, when it comes to women and COVID-19, um, overall women are less vulnerable to viral infections than men. And when men get infected with this, they tend to have more severe disease and higher mortality than women do. So that's the one good piece of good news for being a woman during the pandemic is we're a little less vulnerable, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not losing um, women through the pandemic. Any questions there? Okay. Okay, I've got uh, information on North Carolina data, just knowing that if you wanna look up any information about what's going on with COVID-19 in our state, um, Dr. Mandy Cohen um, has been our health secretary. Um, working very closely with our governor, Roy Cooper. I have developed an incredible girl crush on Dr. Mandy Cohen because she is so smart and so articulate and she has approached um, encouraging policy in North Carolina based on science. And, and you all know that there's been politics because people wanted to reopen businesses versus being on lockdown and all that kind of stuff. She has used the science. Um, most recently when I watched um, Governor Cooper and then Dr. Mandy Cohen um, on UNC TV give a, give a presentation, one of the things she's keeping her eye on, which I think is absolutely wonderful, um, this pandemic has created worse health disparities than we had previously. So as an example, um, people of color usually have not fared nearly as well from a health perspective in the United States as say white individuals have fared. Um, but during the pandemic, those disparities um, between the haves and the have nots or people of color versus people who are white in the United States, those disparities have grown. And one of the things that Dr. Mandy Cohen spoke about is she is keeping her eye on that data and North Carolina is trying to be more strategic when they disperse vaccines. And they have been very organized in North Carolina, by the way. Um, I was just talking with some people from South Carolina yesterday, and nobody's getting that. Even the healthcare workers haven't been vaccinated in South Carolina. But in North Carolina, we have been on it. And a lot of it's Dr. Mandy Cohen. She's keeping her eye on those disparities and making sure that as we go through these phases of who's eligible for the vaccines, is making sure that the most vulnerable rise to the top of the list. And the most vulnerable in many communities means um, individuals of color, okay? Most vulnerable can also mean individuals um, in captive living environments, so nursing homes, jails, things like that. Um, but I was just so pleased to see that the decisions that are being made are being made both based on science based on previous data and trying to not increase those health disparities, but trying to narrow those health disparities. Um, so we're kind of doing it, we're doing it pretty well here in North Carolina. By the way, Dr. Mandy Cohen is moving up to um, the federal government and going to be working with the new administration. So she's getting nabbed from North Carolina. Um, do you all, who in here, and it's okay, just raise your hand or, or speak out and just say, I don't know, has, doesn't understand the flattening the curve, the term flattening the curve. If you don't understand what that means, just shout out and say, explain it. You all got it? Everybody's got it? 
Okay, got to understand. It's trying to, to it's trying to stagger the number of people that would require hospitalization and and require intensive care units. So keeping the spread low enough so that the sickest people who need that health care can access it, and that we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. I can tell you just um, in our county, Appalachian Regional Healthcare and Watauga Medical Center, they have tripled their bed space for intensive care um, for COVID cases, and they are full. Okay, so even in our sweet little town. Um, so just know that the, this is where you can find information if you want more specific information for North Carolina um, by counties in North Carolina, that type of thing. Okay, so let's get a little bit of background on, the virus is actually SARS um, COVID too. And it's much like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. HIV causes the disease AIDS. SARS-CoV-2 causes um, COVID-19. And it was called COVID-19 because it first appeared um, back in 2019, even though we got word of it and started hearing about the spread in 2020, um, it was actually known to be on the earth and spreading in humans as of 2019. Fun fact, the American Red Cross went back and tested blood donations for coronavirus, and they found that they were finding some coronavirus as early as December 13th, 2019. So a clever way of kind of tracking that, taking existing blood donations and looking at when those donations occurred. So many of you have probably heard, I know I have a family member who swears she had it um, in January. And you all probably know of individuals who were quite sick and tested negative for the flu. And it was in hindsight, probably um, COVID-19 infection for many of those individuals. Okay, so this number two, um, it's a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. And so it's, it's a sequel to what was called SARS-CoV-2 or SARS. Um, it's also similar to um, a virus in the same family of viruses that uh, really erupted in the Middle East that we ended up calling MERS. So many of you have some memory of sort of hearing about these other um, infections. They were more epidemics and pandemics, but it's a similar type of virus. And with each of these types of um, respiratory viruses, they seem to jump from bats. So bats harbor the virus, but the bats don't get sick themselves. And you know, bats are vampires, right? Bats feed off of the blood of a mammal. And so it was thought to, for these bats that hold these viruses um, in their bodies and in their saliva, when they bite a mammal, they can transmit the virus from them to the mammal. Um, and at first, we thought that um, it went through an intermediary organism. And it was once suspected that the bats bit this thing down here called a pangolin and infected the pangolin and then humans would eat the pangolin and they thought that was how it would um, transmit. Now there's a little skepticism about if it went through a pangolin or a fish. Now they're thinking that it may have gone directly from bats to humans, um, but that is still a bit unsolved. Okay, so any questions about that transmission? Okay. Okay, so we have all lived through history, you all. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, in 2020, it changed the entire world. And I hope that we get past this. I hope the vaccines and herd immunity and all that, get we get past this and then we're able to look back um, and tell the story of what it was like to be here. I know um, some of you uh, probably lost family and friends. Um, for those of you who hope to have grandchildren at some point in time, I'm waiting any moment, my son and daughter-in-law, I don't think they're there yet, but I'm ready, I'm ready for, to be a grandparent, to be able to tell these sto this story about what it was like to live through this um, to um, individuals in the future. So if we look at, and I'm not, tr I'm trying to be scientific here, I'm not trying to be political, but it's hard anytime you start talking about healthcare 
to not get involved in politics because the way that we think about health and healthcare has been so tied up with politics um, in recent years. So asking, were we prepared? And Dr. Anthony Fauci, um, who is, had been a medical advisor um, to multiple um, presidents and federal administrations, um, he said, no, we were not. That we had knowledge about what was happening in Wuhan, China and about early cases of infection. And we had knowledge about how it was spreading. But in the United States, we stalled. We stalled and we did not act very quickly. Um, our federal government and then many, some state governments have done a really good job and some state governments have not done a great job at trying to prevent spread of infection and prevent death. When it came to vaccine production, and I'm, I'm amazed that it's January of 2021 and we've got vaccines that are being dispersed this quickly. This has been amazing, but it's because there were companies already looking to see what kinds of viruses, what type of genome of viruses were, were spreading. Um, and usually we look to the other side of the world during their winter and our summer to try to predict what flu strain is going to be happening, what other types of virus strains like um, the COVID-2 strain. There were private companies, as well as you all have heard of Bill and Melinda Gates, their foundation has been on the development of vaccines, tracking these viruses um, and on these vaccines um, for years now. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is trying to eradicate and get rid of infectious disease all across the world. So obviously very rich from Microsoft, but they have this huge foundation and um, are very scientific in their thinking and take scientific advice when they decide where they're gonna donate um, from their foundation. So they have been on it. The Gates Foundation has been on it. And then each of these, you've been hearing about these companies for a while now because we've got the vaccines being dispersed, but Moderna um, is the one where you get it and you get your second dose four weeks later. Um, Anovi has been on it. Pfizer has a vaccine that's been approved and is out. With Pfizer, you've got to get your booster three weeks after, not four weeks after. AstraZeneca um, has been on it, developing a vaccine. And AstraZeneca, I'll show you the data on the vaccines here in a bit, is the least effective, but it can be stored in an ordinary refrigerator. So we think AstraZeneca vaccine is actually going to be most helpful for really rural frontier areas of the world because you can get the vaccine out there with just normal refrigeration or a cooler or that kind of thing. So between the Gates Foundation and the private pharmaceuticals, we were prepared. They were, they were on it, okay, they were on it. Dr. Peter Daszak um, uh, had a, 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 it's more of a foundation, I guess is the right word, called EcoHealth. And Dr. Peter Daszak and his, his group of EcoHealth on a regular basis were over in China monitoring the bats. So they had a team of these epidemiologists that would go out, grab these bats, swab them um, to find out what kind of viruses they were carrying, and then take those specimens back to a lab and examine the genome of those viruses. In, and this is important, in order to be able to predict what could be jumping from the bats to the other mammals or jump and then the mammals to the humans or jumping from the bats to the humans. And that ability to predict from the, the bats what they're carrying has been very important in vaccine development, very important in developing medications that fight this infection. Now, this is where it got very political and a lot of it had to do with, um, he's over there in China, he, he and his group, and their lab was in Wuhan. And Wuhan is where, you know, kind of like case zero, where the first infection seemed like they went to other human beings. So one of the conspiracies was that, and I hate when people call this the China virus because that is just so inappropriate, um, but it, it did start spreading in Wuhan, China. But one of the conspiracies is that the lab released it. When it was the lab that was collecting the bat 
specimens, trying to predict what could be in the future transmitted to humans. Any questions about that or any questions about the conspiracy? Now, in a political move and an unprecedented move, the National Institute of Health, which funds research, scientific research in the United States, the National Institute of Health, when they fund a project, the only time they have ever pulled back money is when the project is going wrong. Like they're studying some kind of new medication that's supposed to save people, but it's killing people. That's the only time they would ever have pulled funding. So it was unprecedented. They pulled the funding for EcoHealth and Dr. Peter Daszak's um, back in May, 2020. And it was just totally a political move. The federal government told the NIH to pull that funding, but there was no scientific reason to do so. In fact, the scientific reason would be, oh my gosh, keep funding this project because now that they're not monitoring the bats, here's what scares me. With these vaccines rolling out, we may have an end in sight to COVID-19, but now we don't know what's coming up in the future. We won't have that period of time where we've been able to study and predict. Does that scare anybody else in here? Yeah, part of the reason why we made the advances in the vaccine and the, and the treatments is because we knew. When it came to producing and dispersing personal protective wear and ventilators, we have not done a very good job in the United States on, on that at all. And in fact, we have sold many of our ventilators to Russia. So instead of trying to keep stuff on home turf and take care of our own, um, when it came to the development of medications, we were on it. And that again is because private pharmaceuticals we're tracking, we're monitoring the genome coming out of these viruses, and they were on it. And rem, remdesivir is the only FDA approved medication that is effective in treating the infection. And then we've got some experimental um, medications uh, looking at antibodies. So when individuals have the infection, they produce the antibodies, getting those antibodies and giving them to other individuals. And one brand name is Regeneron. Some of you all heard about that. There have been some um, pretty famous individuals who have become infected and they've been given um, the FDA approved medication as well as Re Regeneron. But if we were to go into ICU right now with this infection, we would probably not have access to this second medication. So any questions about our, either our preparedness or our lack of preparedness for this pandemic? Actually, I have a question really quick. Okay. Um, so I know that there's always like, since this whole pandemic started, there's so many like rumors and conspiracies and stuff. Is it true that there was like a pandemic response team um, that was implemented by the Obama administration that was like removed in this administration? Is that true? That is true. Okay. Yeah. I never knew. I just heard so much about it and so many things. I didn't know if that was actually true or not. So somewhere in here, and I'm trying to speak from science and public health, Sydney and everybody else, um, but my politics are clear. You know, I'm not I'm not hiding anything. But my politics come out of the science. I think I'd like to think. Um, not only did we do some things poorly, but we but we did some things like really poorly. <laughs> you know, you're not just, you know, like, oops, I forgot to think about that. It was in some cases, it was kind of deliberate backtracking. Um, so yeah, that part was not a conspiracy. Any other questions? Okay. And I'm watching, we go from 1230 to 145. So I'm watching my time here. Um, okay, so 2020, dramatic takeover of infectious disease, okay, dramatic takeover, whereas prior to 2020, just on that list of leading causes of death that we talked about, we saw a lot of lifestyle behavior um, driving illness and driving death in the United States. 
Behavior is still driving that, but it's behavior in the form of protecting ourselves, protecting others, trying not to get infected. And if we do get infected, making sure that we isolate um, and not spread it further, that type of thing. So there's still a lot of behavior involved um, in this pandemic. And so again, back to this zoonotic transmission from the bats to um, either another critter or bats directly to um, uh, humans. When we look at the genome that transferred here, it's very different than what would have been a human made genome. So that conspiracy about the Wuhan Institute of, of Virology um, is not the case. Like what they would have made as a man-made virus is not at all the genome that we're seeing spread around. So it came from bats to humans one form or another. Now, when we think about transmission from person to person, um, I've got some data on, some other data on the next slide on transmission. I want us to look at, at some of this droplet research. So a cough spreads about 3,000 droplets and it can travel 50 miles per hour, a cough, 20 feet. And the reason I'm showing you some of this data here is that that six foot distancing, six feet is good, but it's not perfect, okay? When we look at a sneeze, sneezes are pretty powerful. I cannot sneeze quietly. When I sneeze, the, the earth shakes. Um, 30,000 droplets that travel 200 miles per hour, at least 20 feet. Just normal breathing, just normal breathing, we're spreading about 50 to um, 50,000 droplets. And when we're speaking, it's 500 to 500,000 droplets. And then when we're singing, and you all heard about, you know, a church choir where you had an infected person and they're singing together, practicing, rehearsing, and a bunch of them got sick after that. Um, that would be an example of how singing is more powerful, which is why a lot of churches are not necessarily, and um, synagogues and whatnot are not meeting right now and singing together because of that risk. Now, Here's what this has done to the OC part of my brain, you all. I have been teaching, and I tend to teach large section classes over in 114 in the library, and I have taught many classes over in IG Greer um, in my career here. And because my voice projects, I've got a loud voice, I never use... Um, the microphone, I would just speak in those classes. And now it has occurred to me all these years for people to be able to hear me in the back of the classroom, I have been spitting all over my students over and over and over. <laughs> I am so sorry for them, all the spit that I've shared with them just to be able to project my voice. But in some ways, don't you think after this pandemic, we're not gonna, we're not gonna think the same way. I think there's a lot of things that are probably going to be changing. One of the things that I think will be happening very much like a lot of Asian countries and cultures, there are a lot of individuals that mask up on a regular basis or they mask up all throughout the winter months. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see if we've got some changes in our culture because of that. So when we look at infection and our risk of infection, it's exposure to the virus times time. And I know I had to get myself used to when I'm out hiking, as an example, and I'm not masked when I'm out hiking in the woods or at a state park or something like that. At first, it made me very, very nervous when people would pass by, if that makes sense. And now I kind of turn and pet my dog and say hello, you know, but but don't necessarily like, you know, get as scared when somebody simply passes by because even if they are infected and even if there were some droplets, it was a very, very short amount of time. Does that make some sense? So prolonged exposure is gonna be more dangerous than very brief exposure. And then there's this uh, epidemiological statistics it's called r not, and it's, it's written like this, but r not is the number of new cases every existing case creates. And this gives us an idea of how contagious uh, any type of pathogen like a virus can be. And you all have heard that um, at least in England now we know of, although we've seen the new variant here in the United States, there seems to be the old variant of the virus and then a newly discovered variant that is much more contagious but not necessarily more deadly. Have you all heard about that? Um, um, 
anyways, so the R not uh, calculated by the Center for Disease Control is about 2.5 for the first original COVID-19 virus. Okay. Meaning for every one person who has it, they tend to give it to two and a half other people. Does that make some sense? This new variant sounds like the r naught is going to be higher, that it's more contagious, meaning, and I don't know what the number is yet. It hasn't been necessarily estimated, but it could be like one person on average gives it to five people as an example. Questions here. Okay, we're gonna keep trucking along. So we know more about transition of the virus now than we did at the very beginning of the pandemic. And this is one of those beautiful places where thank goodness we've had scientists on this studying these things because it's been very fluid, um, but we need this information. So as an example, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about fomites that you could get, you know, contracted on your hands when you're out in public. There was even concern. Um, I know there were people that would come home from the grocery store, wash down their groceries. Um, sanitize their feet, immediately take a shower and scrub head to toe just from going out to getting groceries. And now we know that that transmission, like touching surfaces and then rubbing your eyes and that kind of stuff is actually kind of rare. It's possible, but it's rare. Now what we know is that the most common form of transmission is contact transmission, which would be direct contact with an infected person. So you're caretaking for somebody who's sick, you've, shake, you've shaken their hand and they've got the virus on their hand and then you touch your face, your nose, your mouth, that kind of thing. And then droplet transmission, which is where, you know, again, speaking, sneezing, coughing, um, the droplet comes out, it's got the virus in it. And then the person near that individual inhales that droplet into their sinuses, into their mouth, into their lungs, or they get it in their eye. That type of transmission now we know is the most common, which is where that six feet social distancing came from. But again, that six feet is a bit arbitrary. It's enough to feel socially awkward, <laughs> right? Um, but technically it's not far enough if you're unmasked and you're breathing or talking with somebody, if that makes some sense. Um, but six feet is definitely better than five feet. That's better than four feet. That's better than really close contact. Okay, so most of it is happening this way. Total airborne transmission is possible because the teeny tiny droplets from individuals can stay suspended in the air for hours. One of the reasons why um, kids seem not to be when they when they get infected seem not to be infecting like adults. One way of thinking about it, kids are small. They're closer to the ground. Their little droplets drop out of their little little bodies down to the ground a lot faster than our droplets if we're a taller person drop to the ground. But these these airborne these are teeny tiny droplets that can hang out in the air for a while. Which is why now we know, we didn't know this very well at the very beginning of the pandemic, we need to be really careful about being in enclosed spaces, which is why churches, synagogues, movie theaters, um, gyms, um, restaurants, um, that type of thing. We need to be really careful about prolonged exposure. And again, like say eating inside in a restaurant tends to be prolonged. You're in there for about an hour, that kind of thing. And then we're being much more careful about good ventilation right now. Even ASU, ASU for energy savings would recycle the air in buildings. And now ASU has stopped doing that. All of the air that comes in for heat or comes in for air conditioning, they are pulling fresh air from the outside and taking the air that, that exits from the inside and pushing it outside. They're not recycling it anymore because now we know that good ventilation is important. So if you had to, let's say when I have been around family members over the holidays eating, we've done our eating outside and our masking inside, if we could eat outside and be distance um, and not inside where there's poor ventilation. Questions about that transmission. So most of it we know is going from human breath and droplets. That's how the, most of the infection is spreading. 
The fomite transmission, which scared a lot of us, including me at the beginning of the, the pandemic, seems it, it happens, but it's rare, okay? So again, if you go and let's say you grab some groceries and you exit the grocery store and you sanitize your hands, you should be good. Yeah, not requiring the full shower, all that kind of stuff. But then the scary thing is some of these, this, this virus is pretty hardy. They, they found on cruise ships. Um, so when people were infected on a cruise ship and then they sent in the epidemiologist to um, uh, test everything, they found that the virus in some cases was living 14 days on a surface. So like living 14 days on a cell phone kind of thing or 14 days on a sink where people had touched the sink. So that's kind of scary. Um, so anyways, in all of this, behavior is key to transmission. Um, we also know from tracking spread, most people, this is kind of scary. You hear a lot about these super spreaders and we'll talk about that in a minute. But most people who have contracted the infection have, somebody has brought it into their home. That's where they were exposed in their home. So the person who's working and going to and from work, the healthcare provider who is at high risk because they're taking care of infected patients. Um, it's, and then you've had these family gatherings. Um, so in many cases, so brought to them in their home. And then this is why these contained spaces have been especially dangerous um, for super spread. So nursing homes, jails, um, those types of places. Um, are some of the most vulnerable individuals and you've, he you've heard about um, lots of contagion happening there. Public bathrooms, um, this is something that got me thinking about um, Smith Wright Hall for you psych majors, you know Smith Wright, your exercise science majors might know this, as well as other public bathrooms on campus. So when an individual is infected, the virus sheds through their feces. And one of the ways that they're monitoring um, infection rates is by monitoring sewage and the viral load in sewage. They're doing this at ASU now. Um, they're taking a look and they're tracking um, infection in our town by the amount of virus that has been shed in, in feces in sewage, which is actually, it's gross, but brilliant, <laughs> a brilliant way of being able to track. Um, but when we poop and we flush and there's no lid down, if you are infected, that virus gets plumed in the air, which is really disgusting, right, to think about. Um, but just as an example, the toilets in Smith Wright have no lids. It's not like you can go do your business and put the lid down when you flush. Um, and so that's kind of scary that infected individuals could be aer aerosawing the virus um, just by using the bathroom. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about poop for today. Um, another scary thing, and you all know this, like, you know, rule of thumb has been treat yourself as if you, um, even if you're asymptomatic, that you could be infected. Um, and this is where a lot of spread has occurred where people are like, well, I'm not sick, so I know I don't have the infection. Up to 44% of people who are infected are asymptomatic. They have no signs or symptoms of disease. And what's scary about that is those asymptomatic people can shed the virus and they're contagious for a good five days. Okay. And another scary thing, which is unusual compared to the flu and other kinds of infections that most of us um, were used to experiencing, it used to be like you got sick from the flu, you got sick and right when you got sick, you knew you were infected. You weren't infected the day before. But in this situation, when people are infected, even if they're asymptomatic, they're most contagious before they have symptoms. So before the headache starts, before the cough starts, before the achy or the fever starts, they were infected back in time. Okay. And then we get these super spreaders. I think we had some super spreading going on um, January 6th um, at the Capitol in Washington, DC. Um, you all have heard about, we had um, early in the pandemic around here locally, um, some of the Tyson um, chicken plants in Wilkes, there was super spread going on um, for those um, chicken processors. You all have heard about meat packing plants where people are working closely together have been super spreaders. 
And then things like weddings, funerals. We, we saw a wave after Thanksgiving where people gathered. We were now in the wave of people being sick after um, the Christmas holidays in the United States. Um, certain businesses, restaurants, airports, classrooms, indoor sporting events, you all you know about these kinds of places where it's very easy for one infected person to infect a lot of people. So questions here about transmission. Okay. Vaccines, they're gonna save us. Can't wait to get one. Um, so you all have heard about Pfizer and BioNTech. We usually shorten this one and just call it Pfizer. Um, it's two injections. It's an RNA virus genetic code where they've taken a slice of the coronavirus and the genetic code. And they have found that if you put that into human beings in the form of vaccination, the body reacts as if it is infected, forms all kinds of nice antibodies so that um, should you be infected um, by the virus, your body already has immunity to it, just like all the immunizations we've had in the past for measles, uh, polio, all that kind of stuff. Um, building up immunity to, to this virus is a very important thing. Um, it is 90% effective, but it has to be stored very, very cold. I can't even conceptualize what negative 75 looks like. Um, Moderna, um, that has been, these two have been FDA approved and they are being dispersed at this point in time. It's also two injections, but it's four weeks apart, not three weeks. 95% effective. I remember Dr. Fauci talking about if we could get a vaccine that had about 50% effectiveness, that would be a blessing. <laughs> and we are at 90 and 95% effective. This is amazing, you all. Um, this is amazing effectiveness and how well these are working. Um, the Oxford, uh, the company AstraZeneca, Oxford the University, AstraZeneca, the pharmaceutical company, it is only 70% effective, but it can be stored in a regular refrigerator, which is why I've said this is probably going to be more of a valuable vaccine um, to push out in really remote areas that do not have hospital epicenters with really fancy refrigeration, particularly that can go 75, negative 75 Celsius. Um, just to give you all perspective, I have been a regular flu vaccine person. In my mind, if we can prevent disease, oh yeah, let's prevent disease. <laughs> yeah, let's prevent disease for me. Let's prevent disease for you. You know, I, I've just always followed that philosophy and I had no problem vaccinating my sons growing up. Um, I worried about all the kids in their classrooms that weren't vaccinated. Um, and then I get my yearly flu vaccination. These are only 40 to 60% effective. And you've heard of cases, this is part of the reason why you get a little skepticism. There's other reasons you get skepticism about vaccines, like they cause autism when they don't. You hear about people say, well, I, I went and got a flu shot this year and then I got the flu. But if you had a flu vaccine, then likely you had a less severe case of the flu than you would have had without the vaccine. But there's error here. Yeah, there are some people who got the flu vaccine and they didn't accurately predict the genetic code of that flu strain that was going around. So yeah, but when you look at how these COVID-19 vaccines so much more effective than a flu vaccine, okay? So this is one of the places where these pharmaceutical companies and science, they have done really well and we've been sort of lucky in how effective this has been, okay? So just to give you an idea and keep in mind uh, dead virus in the flu. Any questions about the vaccines? If you all are in Boone, and I know many of you are, are not in Boone, um, or wherever you are, if you are interested in, in Boone, Watauga County Health Department has been very organized. I'm already on the vaccine list. As soon as they have one for a person like me in my risk level, um, they will contact me and I will get, go get my first vaccine. Right now in Watauga County, they're vaccinating anybody 65 and older. All the healthcare providers have been offered it. Nursing home individuals have all been offered it. And now they're, now they're rolling through it in their list when people register, they're rolling through the different risk categories. Um, so if you would like to, if your primary care provider does not um, offer you a vaccine and you would like to get one, get on your health department's wait list. 
that's a way of, of, of trying to make that happen. What they're doing in Watauga County, and they're doing this in a lot of other places across the United States too, they have their risk category and they offer it to everybody who wants it in that risk category. If they have leftover vaccine, they're jumping to the next level of risk because they're just trying to disperse and get as many people out there vaccinated as possible. So they're not waiting you know, for everybody in that risk category necessarily to come. If they've got leftovers, they're moving it on. One of my friends who's the exact same risk I'm at, she's already gotten it, but she got it because there was leftover at a big vaccination project at the high school in Watauga County. She just got a call and said, we've got some, if you can get over here within the next 30 minutes, you can have it. And she was like, I'm on my way and was able to get it. Okay, I'm going to... I have a question. Sure. Uh, do you know which of the vaccines they're giving out at the, the Appalachian one? Um, from what the health department is saying, they've got, I believe they've got the Pfizer and the Moderna. Okay, um, so it's just random maybe. Yeah, um, but when... Okay. Yeah, and it could be that um, they're keeping the really cold one right at the health department, but like the thing that they did at the high school, they may have just had normal refrigeration. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. But they will tell if you get it, they will tell you, and then you get a certificate, and then they will tell you, do you need to get your booster in three weeks or do you need to get your booster in, you know, so if it's Pfizer, it's three weeks. If it's Moderna, it's four weeks. Okay. Yeah, but they're not dispensing the AstraZeneca one locally. And then they've done, and this is one of the places where um, the federal government, I'm so glad they made this decision. They were going to give people their first shot and then hold vaccines back for them. So they would get their first one, but then they already had right there their second one. And then they would come back three weeks later or four weeks later and get it. But they've switched their strategy now that they've got enough production of the vaccines. So you get your first one and they're not holding your second one. You're expecting your second one to be produced by time you get to that date. So they're in, and in that strategy, they're getting more people vaccinated with the first round than they would have. And the good news is, this is other blessing good news from these vaccines. People are getting really good immunity with the first dose. So it's not like, I mean, you still need to be careful after you get your first dose and mask and all that kind of stuff. Um, but really nice effectiveness from the first dose and then the second dose, the booster just topping it off. Um, so that was really good news. Yeah. Another thing that happened accidentally in one of the clinical trials with, um, I can't remember if this was Moderna or Pfizer. They made they accidentally gave pe their participants half of the dose of the first vaccine, but they found that half of the dose worked just as well as the full dose. And then so because of that accidental scientific discovery, now we've got twice as many doses, if that makes some sense from that. So last semester when I presented the pandemic lecture, it was all pessimism. At least this semester, we've got the pessimism um, and what has happened in our world as well as some optimism. And plan for Thursday will to be keep talking about um, finishing up with the pandemic kind of stuff and then really moving over and focusing on why should we in particular focus and study women's health. Any questions? Come visit me during my office hours if anybody wants to be meet me more personally or have any questions. Good to see you. See you on Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.